Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I thank all the partnered agencies from the fire department and the public and the law enforcement agencies that we have here today. And we're going to discuss the manhunt of Joshua Stewart that began on Friday, September 28th and concluded yesterday, October 1st. This all began on the early morning hours of Friday, September 28th at approximately 4 a.m. when Joshua K. Stewart of Pine Lane and Kerhonkson went to the Allenville Regional Hospital because he was complaining of abdominal pains. He drove himself to the hospital. He was greeted by the emergency room staff there who admitted him and they started to assess him as a patient there for abdominal pains. While he was there, he became highly belligerent. It began with verbal, um, a verbal altercation and it, per it continued and it actually escalated into a physical altercation where he became extremely violent and belligerent in the hospital because that he, the care wasn't uh, occurring fast enough and he wasn't getting relief for his alleged pain that he was there for. At this time, Joshua Stewart knocked a Sharps container off the wall and, and demanded pain medication. And when he believed that the hospital staff was not moving fast enough, which I can assure you they were, they were doing everything in their power to assist him medically, uh, he then uh, ordered the nurse to open the, 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 the medicine cabinet that had the pain medication in it. And when she was having a conversation with him, he then displayed or pulled out a nine millimeter handgun, which he then started waving around in, in the room he was being treated in. Uh, the nurse went over, to, or the medical staff went over to the uh, cabinet and wanted to know what he wanted. He became very upset and he discharged one round in, her, in their direction, striking the cabinet. He was then given the pain medications and he decided to gather his belongings, still armed with the handgun. He tried to exit the hospital, but instead he was actually headed towards the lobby of the hospital where they had, you know, they basically went into a lockdown. The security guard had responded. There were patients in here. The lobby had people in it, even though it was four o'clock on a Friday morning. I, I wanted. I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that the, the folks at the hospital are heroes today. You have to understand that. Uh, watching the video surveillance and not being there personally, they actually attempt. These unarmed people in the hospital actually attempt to soothe and calm him. Now he just fired a round at them. They come and sue them and tell them that they will escort him out of back entrance of the emergency room to his, to his vehicle, which they do and he complies and he actually is diverted away from where the people are actually gathered in the lobby of the hospital. How many lives they saved, who knows, but those people are heroes today. They get him outside, he gets into his Dodge Ram pickup truck and flees the scene. They calmly come back inside, they call 911 in Ulster County who broadcast the event to all the surrounding agencies and they have a mass uh, response and they are looking for this vehicle in the greater Warsing area. Uh, the New York State Police along with the Ulster County Sheriff's Department and the New York City Department of Environmental Protection Police all saturate the area and within about 20 to 30 minutes while these two astute New York City Department of Environmental Protection officers are checking the areas off of 55 and Cutler Road in Lundy, which is the lower half of the state forest there, very rural, mostly ATV trails. Uh, they're doing their job. They're looking for this vehicle. They end up coming upon this vehicle, the white pickup truck that was uh, given out broadcast by the Ellenville Hospital. They do their job. They approach it cautiously. It's sitting at a gate that is put across a seasonal or for all intents and purposes private ATV or, or trail. Um, as the, the police officers approach in their vehicle, the truck rams the gate and takes off down this path. These astute police officers then give chase with the state police and the sheriff's department close behind. Uh, this, this vehicle continues down so it can no longer travel down the trail because of a large tree down. The subject gets out of the vehicle. These two police officers get out. They immediately recognize that this, the description of the, the perpetrator from the Ellenville Hospital shooting incident. And, and this is where the, the miracle happens, is these two police officers rely on their training. They give verbal commands to Mr. Stewart to drop his weapon, turn, face them, and, and they do what they're trained to do to arrest them. And in turn, he actually turns to them and immediately opens fire on them. They take tactical positions at, and, and undercover as he approaches them firing. They engage him with gunfire back 
where then he retreats back into the woods. They pull back out to establish a perimeter and call in so that they can get support, and that's exactly what happens. At that point, multiple agencies and response comes, and as you know, over the next couple of days, it becomes a, a tactical uh, exercise for all law enforcement, you know, from the federal agencies through the state to the local. We had um, several agencies that, that came to the area and to the aid, uh, not just the New York City the Department of Environmental Protection Police, Ulster County Sheriff's Department, the New York State Police, but we also had, you know, uh, assistance from the Ulster County District Attorney's Office, the Village of Ellenville Police responded, um, and, and there were others of the Forest Rangers and the Department of Environmental Conservation Police also came and joined the manhunt for Joshua Stewart, who is now believed to be in this thickly settled uh, forest, state forest land of Lundy Estates between basically Lundy Road and Route 55, buffered by that Cutler Road and everything north, so in the Jaegerville and in that area. And for, fo for the folks that don't know that, it is an extremely treacherous, rocky, forest, dangerous area with a lot of ATV trails that kind of crisscross like uh, spider webs. Um, at that point, we did what the law enforcement normally does to protect the community, and over the next day or two, we worked on just isolating the area to keep everyone safe, and we put out as much of the information to the community as possible. And I will tell you that we could not do this, and I'll get to the conclusion in a second, but this could not be accomplished without several people being mentioned. And when I say people, I'm talking more of a community effort. Between the, the folks at Ellenville Hospital, to the folks in the school district in the area, to the community members themselves, by giving us information that wasn't useless, they actually gave us good information, we knew at almost all times that Joshua Stewart was in this area until late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. We knew that we had him contained in this area, and as police officers, and it might think, and you know, you look at the TV and, and you watch these shows that end in 45 minutes and we get them really quick, it's one of these things that it becomes a tactical nightmare where you have this state rugged forest area where your radios aren't working, cell phone communication is not working, so we have to be very methodical so that we don't injure members of the public or ourselves. So we had that perimeter set up, we notified all the community, we were getting great support from them, and we set up a command post here at the, Nap the Napanock Firehouse on Plank Road. And Chief Rich Thorpe and his uh, men and women of the community that are part of this fire department came out, opened this facility up for us, and supported us for the, the duration of the event. I have to say, these are volunteers, folks. These are people that called in sick to work or didn't go to work because of the support level they gave us during this. And that support level was enough to fuel our police officers to make sure the job got done. And I can't say enough that they were serving us food, getting us refreshments, the public was pouring in, giving us information and refreshments and food to keep the police officers able to do a 24-hour perimeter to keep this subject out of their harm's way and in the state forest. Um, at this time, and we'll go back to the timeline, we were sure all of Friday into Saturday he was in the state forest property. And we knew at some point that Josh Stewart was going to have to surface. We were squeezing enough. We had enough information out there that we believed we were going to squeeze him into making a move. And it came late Saturday night into early Sunday morning. So it was the 29th into the 30th of September when um, late evening on Saturday, we started to get burglar alarms along the Route 55 corridor from Route 55A down to Sportsman Road, which is not that terribly long. It's a mile or two corridor, and it's narrow. And we started to get what we call electronic intrusion devices and different alarms. When we started to respond now in that area, that was within side of our perimeter, so we started to squeeze our resources that way and mobilize over there. We actually had him on the run to the point where he got into one house, had a flee, um, tried to bed down, and then we started following the different attempted burglaries uh, larcenies to vehicle, and then unfortunately, he was able, early morning Sunday on the 30th, he was able to lay and wait and get into a subject's vehicle off of Route 55 and in the Sportsman Road area, and he was able to get through our perimeter and get out, um, uh, you know, through his vehicle. I would say that, and I'd be remiss that if I tell you I didn't make a mistake, I did in the tactical awareness to let him get away, 
And once he got out of our perimeter, the, again, the astute police officers that we had in the area confronted this vehicle in Kerhonks and on the road and was able to get and know where he was headed. Now, it's not one of these line of sight uh, things, but it was enough that when they got the description and we looked back, we had other things in play where we were able to identi quickly identify that vehicle. We were the ability of all the law enforcement partners that we had here and remotely, we were able to track that vehicle to the confines of Brooklyn, New York, in the city, where he made his appearance uh, sometime on September 30th. At that point, we immediately you know, took what we had. We were in contact with our law enforcement, federal, state, and city partners down in New York City. Um, they were wonderfully received with the information we gave them. They jumped right on it between the state police, the city police, and the federal partners we have down there, and they were able to contain him again to a very small uh, a section of Brooklyn. And I won't comment too much on what they did down there. It would be unfair because I was not there, but they did an absolutely fantastic job with what they did and keeping us informed. But in the meantime, we stayed in place up here, and that's important because the partners that you see behind me all participated in that decision knowing that this subject's home base was here in Kerhonkson. Just because he was a couple hours away, it didn't, you know, it wasn't foolproof that he was going to stay there. So what we did is we stayed in place here with the, you know, auspices that he may return to the area and cause more harm or criminal activity. And we were going to, we were all in agreement, every person you see up here, that we were going to do that no matter how long it took until he was uh, taken into custody. And then real briefly, uh, late yesterday afternoon, early evening, we were notified up here at the command post in the Napanock Firehouse that um, Joshua Stewart was taken into custody in the confines of the 78th Precinct in Brooklyn um, by a regional fugitive task force, and he was taken into custody safely, which is the most important thing. And once we were notified of that, we immediately notified the area between the council folks and the supervisors, the politicians, the school districts, the hospital, and all your law enforcement partners you see here, and we returned the, the community to normal. Um, and at this time, you know, like I said, I won't comment on what happened in New York City, but uh, again, this dangerous subject who's willing to go to any means to get what he wanted by the use of a firearm, not only displaying it, but using it, I can't say enough of the partnerships you see here between the agencies and the community, the fire department, the folks that live here, that's really what allowed this to end so successfully without anybody being injured. So at this time, that kind of concludes what the summation I have here. I'll just remind everybody, I am not going to comment on the investigation in New York City. It wouldn't be fair to their criminal investigation um, that they have going on. But what I've told you is about as much as I will say of what happened in New York City yesterday to take them into custody. May we get your name, please? Yes. Michael Drake, and I'm the captain with the New York State Police, the zone commander in Kingston. Can you go back to... Um in, uh, I think it was Saturday or Sunday morning, he stole a car, and law enforcement had a perimeter up, but he broke through the, he, he got, he broke through the perimeter and got past you? Yep, that's correct. So in something like this, and I think I briefly mentioned that I'll take full responsibility for him getting out of here, um, we make tactical decisions to move and try to squeeze an area in that 55 corridor. When you start moving resources at that point, you don't no longer have a stagnant perimeter, so there are gonna be gaps. As we moved, it's by chance of luck, and I'm not taking, I'm not making excuses, but he was able to get right through where we had just moved, and we know that for a fact that he had gotten and slipped right through. As we moved our solid perimeter, he was able to squeeze through and actually just get out. But the only good thing is, and I can say, is that within a few minutes, we had contact with that vehicle and knew right away that it was Joshua Stewart. So, so we were case, able to track. I'm sorry, it's a case of um, him not getting through your roadblock. Correct. It was a gap. Obviously, you can't be everywhere at all yes, times. Sir. So he got through a gap. V very luckily, if he played the lottery, I'd like to have the numbers that he had, but yes, sir. And if I may, yes, uh, I think you said it started with him hitting, a, you mentioned sharps. Are those the used needles? The, yeah, the sharps container in the hospital is where they dispose of the needles. That is insignificant to the case. It was just that he was causing property damage. That happened to be next to him, and he ripped it off the wall, which shows the escalation of his verbal abuse that he was giving the staff to now his physicalness to the violence that he portrayed by, by discharging one round at the, at the folks in the hospital. And he brought the weapon in with him to yes, the emergency sir. room. Yes, sir. Um, I guess I've been to an ER in a while. You're not searched or... Uh... Again... 
it's very difficult, especially early morning in these rural uh, emergency rooms where they're doing their best. They do have security, but to my knowledge, you know, you walk in with it, metal detectors, I mean, some hospitals may have them, some don't. I can't speak on what Ellenville Regional Hospital has, but I will go back to say they're heroes. There's no doubt in my mind that they, they, they acted, I mean, you couldn't train for what they did, and they did exactly what they did. I have no, no doubts in my mind that lives were saved because of what they did. And I'm sorry to dominate, but um, when the shot was fired, you mentioned the hospital went on lockdown. Yes, sir. Did security move towards that area, or can you be more specific? I won't, about I won't get too specific. I will say security was security was involved in safeguarding the folks in the hospital, and the staff in the emergency room made a very split second decision to direct him away from where he was headed and get him out of an entrance where there was nobody and right to his vehicle. If that makes sense, yes, sir. Is he back here now, or is he still um, I won't comment. He is not in custody here. He's in custody still down in the city, and that's as far as I'll go with where he is or where his physical location is. Will he be charged first here or down there? So I'll defer to the, the district attorney's office for charges. Um, I, I, well, I'll just defer to the district attorney's office for charges at this point. Can you address that? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Gerard Van Moen. I'm the senior assistant DA who's going to be handling this case. Uh, in terms of charges, uh, this matter will be presented to a grand jury. The grand jury will evaluate all relevant charges. Uh, many of those charges have been detailed by uh, Captain Drake already, uh, the nature of the charges. So we will, will we see um, attempted murder of a police officer since he engaged the uh, DEP officers? Again, we can't uh, tell you exactly what charges the grand jury will consider. It's too premature at this point. Uh, but um, the facts that were laid out by Captain Drake uh, pretty much uh, infer what type of behavior and, and charges the grand jury will consider. Will he be charged first here or down there? Because he apparently stole the vehicle down there, right? The vehicle or, or, was or, stolen up here in, in okay. town of Worsing. But he engaged, uh, he robbed? Uh, he we don't know. We're don't not going to comment on okay. their criminal investigation okay. down there, sir. Captain Drake, yes, uh, I apologize for being late. And I no, no. This. Um, was, was, um, was he going to the ER for it? What was the purpose of his visit to the ER? So he went to the emergency room to be treated for abdominal pains. Can you tell us, Captain, is he, is he a known um, drug addict? Does he have drug problems at all? So I don't want to speak too, too much on what my perspective and the law enforcement community's perspective of, of his past as far as, um, you know, drug addictions, because I don't think it would be fair to the criminal investigation. But what I can tell you is, his purpose of going to the hospital was solely to obtain uh, pain medications one way or another because he went with a firearm and he used it. Was he there on behalf of another patient? He was there solely by himself. by himself. He yep. traveled there in the vehicle by himself, went into the emergency room by himself, admitted him by himself, and was escorted out, got in the vehicle, and left by himself. And so he, he, had a history, he had a history of robbing a, um, uh, holding up a uh, drugstore in the area too a few years ago. So Joshua Stewart, you know, he, he's a 42-year-old male, He's a product of Kronson. He's a local gentleman. He's had his checkered past, uh, you know, of different, I won't say anything directly on each charge he's ever been arrested for, but, you know, Joshua Stewart's a troubled man throughout his whole life for 42 years and has kind of graduated from these petty offenses to now, you know, firing on nurses or medical staff in an emergency room and to, to police officers. And uh, thank God, like I said, for everybody's assistance because now he's in custody and he's away from harming the public. The abdominal pain, that was a ruse to get into the ER. I couldn't speak on that. I wasn't there. And, you know, to be honest with you, it would be unfair for me to speak. If maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But one way or another, he wanted the pain medications, and he, he was going to get it whether they were going to give it to him or he was going to use force, which he ended up having to do. But that was his stated reason when he arrived. He, he right? was looking. Yes, he was in distress in his, in his abdomen area, and he kept demanding pain medications. That's correct. Who has him? Who, who has him in custody right now? Um, like I said, I'm not going to speak to who has him right this second, but I can only say that he was taken into custody in the confines of the 78th Precinct in Brooklyn by the Regional Fugitive Task Force. And this, is, is, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If, what's the extradition procedure? I mean, there's usually somebody's taken into custody and then they extradite I, I, I'll just, I, I won't even go to the DA's office. Like I said, that's a complicated process. I know I keep kind of deferring those questions, and I know it gets annoying. And, and, it, and what happens, we're in the, the biggest thing was putting him into custody. He's not going to get out. He's been, you know, held on these charges um, from their criminal investigation in New York City. And like the district attorney's office has mentioned before, 
they will now work together between the city, federal, and, and the local county department. They will now try to figure out, and it's going to take a little while, but I can assure you that he's in custody and he's not going to cause any harm anytime soon to the public and especially to the town of Warson. Yes, so, Robert, take it back to the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the trail in, uh, off Lundy Road. Yes, sir. When he stopped there, was it DEP police or forest rangers that he was confronting? So, I'll defer to the chief from the, the Department of Environmental Protection for New York City. It was his officers that heroically confronted him. Yeah, it was uh, two officers step working up, out sir. Two. Could you step the mic? It was two officers working out of the Gramsville precinct. Oh. Um, that were on patrol that confronted him on uh, off of Were they just, you know, just patrolling and lucked out, or were they summoned down there by so the... They were on patrol, and we, we all are on the same radio system, mm -hmm. and we're aware of the alert that had gone out. I wanted to get back to that same radio system, because that's a fairly new development, is it not? In no, the, in Ulster County, uh, we've been on a unified 911 system for a very long time, oh, okay. and uh, we all have a great working relationship and work together regularly. Chief, what's your name, please? Uh, Frank Malazzo. It's M-I-L-A-Z-Z-O. Is there a timeline for this individual to come back up here to face charges? Um, you know, again, it, it's a very uh, painstaking process that, uh, and I'm glad I don't work for the DA's office, there's a lot of procedural issues that they'll have to deal with so I can't say he's going to be here tomorrow or today. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Van Loon won't say that either. But at some point, he'll have to answer one way or another for the crimes that he committed to the community in the town of Warson. Yes, sir. Wherever he's being held right now, is he going to stay there until um, a determination is made on what proper charges and where? He, you know, usually what will happen is they'll go with the initial charge. And again, I won't speak on what their investigation is about. And then these folks will sit down over the next day or two and hash out, okay, what are we looking at? What are we going to do? And they'll figure it out from there. So there is a litany of charges that he could be facing between the federal and the state levels um, that he's committed over the last, you know, three, four days. And that's going to take time. But yes, he'll be held right now until they make a determination of where he'll be moved, why he'll be moved, and for what. Where does he live? Like, where's his place so, of residence? What town? Uh, he lives in on Pine Lane. That's kind of his residence in Kerhonkson, which is still in the town of Warsing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Last one. Um, <laughs> Better make it good. Um, <laughs> when he left in the vehicle, when he uh, got through the perimeter and left in that vehicle, did he take someone's vehicle? Did someone pick him up? So he yeah. left the hospital in his vehicle, his, his white Dodge Ram pickup truck, and then once the, the police officers from the Department of Environmental Protection Police Department confronted him, he had to abandon that vehicle, and then we had him locked in, and then he stole another person's vehicle within the next couple of days off of Route 55 Sportsman Road area of Warsing. That's where that vehicle was stolen, and then he had that until he was taken into custody in, the, in Brooklyn. Was it a carjacking? No, it was not. So it was just taken from... Stolen from the driveway of a residence. That's correct, sir. Were there keys in that car when you took it? Uh, I won't comment on that particular thing. All right, I thank you very much, but the only thing I'll leave you with is, like I said, I know that I kind of stole the show, but every person standing up here, their agency, and the folks at that hospital are the ones that saved the lives out there. Can you tell me the, the prescription drug? I won't do that either. That's, that's too detailed. I apologize. Was the car was stolen, though? Yes, no. by, the, by the owner. By the owner. Were and the it owner? was in the path that the crimes that we were following, it was kind of in the, in the path that he was. We, we knew we had him, and that tactical error that I made was able to let him get out. Yes, sir. Last one. Were they opioids? Uh, yes, they were. 